Good Thanks to speak to you. Thanks for taking the time uh, this morning to talk to us here on Talk Radio. So I don't know if you heard my introduction there, but I mean, in the last 24 hours, I've heard that this new variant is going to be the worst thing in the world. I've also heard that it's actually nothing to worry about. Christmas will go ahead and that it isn't uh, resistant to the vaccine. Is it fair to say that we simply don't know yet? Yeah, I think it's it's difficult at this stage to say that much with a huge degree of certainty. But I guess what we can say is what we what we know so far. And listen, I'm not a scientist, but the South African uh, public health system has actually got a really good um, uh, virus surveillance model. And uh, they're very, very good at uh, tracking the virus. They're very, very good at analyzing it. And the uh, data we've got out of South Africa uh, shows that this mutation, uh, sorry, this vi vi variant has got a lot of mutations and the more mutations that uh, exist particularly for example on parts of the virus where the vaccine is targeted for example the spike protein you know we're learning a lot about all of these kind of like quite obscure terms but spike proteins is one of the main ways that the vaccines target to try and nullify the virus it seems like there are multiple mutations on that uh, spike protein now, that gives a likelihood that um, it will uh, make it less, that make the vaccines less effective. So there is some uh, real cause for concern. Um, what this will play out in terms of the, the global pandemic remains to be seen. But, you know, Crystal, we've spoken about this in the past. Um, we, we, we spoke um, a few months ago about what the consequences of failing to deliver global vaccine equity could be. And we spoke about the fact that, you know, new variants were going to be made more likely by leaving large populations unvaccinated. And, you know, I'm not a, the, the, the person that ran the alarm bell on this. Experts have been warning of this since before we even had vaccines. We've known that one of the consequences of, uh, you know, having lots of people vaccinated in one part of the world and, and virtually nobody vaccinated in another is that we give the virus more opportunity to mutate and the opportunity for more variants to develop, which ultimately is going to come back and risk our pandemic response here in the UK. So you're saying that had people been vaccinated for the original strain, um, then there would have been less chance of that original strain being able to mutate? But I also, some people listening to this might be confused by that because also the vaccine doesn't stop people passing it on, nor COVID still existing. It just reduces your the severity. So if the vaccine doesn't stop COVID from being passed on to people, why would the vaccine have stopped a more deadly variant coming along? So, yes, I mean... First of all, uh, the viruses or the vaccines do help to reduce the rates of transmission. So it does help to slow the spread of, of, the, of the virus. So um, that means that we have fewer cases of the virus being passed between different people. And we also know that when you're vaccinated, you're able to get, um, you get less sick and you get better sooner. And so you suppress the virus more quickly. So there's fewer opportunities for you to transmit the virus to other people. So overall, that suppresses the level of virus that's in a population and therefore just makes means that there are less cases and less opportunities for the virus to mutate. So there's a very clear link really between getting people vaccinated as quickly as possible um, and being able to control the, the spread and control the risks of uh, variants developing. And, you know, really what we need to do is figure out how we allowed this to happen in the first place. And what we've been saying and what countries, including South Africa, ironically, have been saying for well over a year is that we do not currently um, have the system set up to allow scale up of global vaccine access in the way that is needed. And that's why we're seeing the huge discrepancies between the rates of vaccines in the you know, in the north and, and, and versus in the global south. And the cause of that is essentially the control that uh, a small number of pharmaceutical companies have over these uh, vaccines, the monopolies that allow them to determine who gets access and at what price. And we could be producing hundreds of millions more doses of vaccine if that technology was shared and we allowed others to produce it. But the UK government is one, just the UK and the EU basically at this stage, are the only two uh, governments 
opposing a global agreement to temporarily waive those patents and those other monopoly protections to allow that to happen. So we have to ask what responsibility, and I would say a lot of it falls at the feet of Boris Johnson for both the unnecessary deaths that are going to play out around the world as a consequence of this new variant, but what impact it has here in deaths in the UK and the impact on the NHS. If, as, as you know, people are worrying about, we have to go back into another lockdown, we have to return to wearing masks and other forms of social distancing and virus control. That responsibility for those ha having to be reintroduced will be at the feet of Boris Johnson for failing to deliver global vaccine access. Uh, however, there are going to be people listening to this thinking that you're absolutely catastrophizing. We don't know for sure yet because this new variant hasn't been around for long enough. I mean, what would you say to those people? Because, you know, that's going to worry people when in actual fact this new variant might not be so bad. We don't know that yet. So I'm, I'm really hope that this is not the case. You know, obviously, in all of these contexts, you do not know exactly what's going to happen. And you hope against hope that it's it's not going to be the worst case scenario. Um, but what we are seeing from the very early data that's coming out from South Africa is that the level of mutations that this uh, virus uh, variant has are really quite considerably greater than would be expected. You know, we, we kind of see viruses uh, play out and mutate normally over time. It seems like this one has jumped a few steps ahead of where we expected to be in terms of the level of mutations that have, have played out. So there is cause for concern. Um, and I think what we need to be thinking about in this context is not only how we um, mitigate what happens as a result of this, but how do we stop this from happening? Because if we don't do something about global vaccine access, then it's just going to be rinse and repeat. We are going why, to why be... Is, why is this Chris Whitty, though, saying that this is less worrying than Delta, then? So I haven't seen all of the details of the science and I'm not a scientist myself, uh, so um, I, I can't say what, what his analysis is but based is, on. Isn't, isn't the logic that the more mutations of a virus, and again, I'm not a scientist, I'm just going by what I've read, but isn't the logic that the more mutations you have of a virus, the weaker that virus gets with each mutation? So the mutations are random. Okay. Um, what they do is, you know, uh, there are multiple, multiple changes that happen, small alterations and imperfections and, and tweaks in the way that the virus plays out over time. Some of those will make it less, you know, consequential, less harmful. Some of them will make it more. Um, and I guess the question is, the, do the number of uh, alterations in this variant um, make it, you know, easier to spread? Does it make it, you know, does it increase the risk for different population groups? Uh, does it increase the risk of severe disease? Does it have greater long-term consequences? Um, and does it evade the effects of the vaccines? And those are the questions which we don't know all of the answers to right now, I agree. Um, but, you know, we really need to be, uh, I guess in, in some of these contexts with this, it's, it's better to be um, more cautious and do um, the the most diligent uh, response that you can to a to a new variant, in the, uh, and hope that um, it doesn't play out as badly. But knowing that if it does play out quite badly, you you've taken the precautions that keep people alive. However, if it is as a result of a lack of vaccine access that caused this to happen, why is it that those people who seem to be infected with this new Omicron variant are vaccinated? Um, so I'm not sure that we know that completely yet. Um, I think the the information that we've got from um, from South Africa and from other places, um, I, I haven't seen data that that tell, tells me or that shows that um, there's a prevalence of this or a greater number of people who have this have, have been vaccinated. I, I do know that the context in South Africa is that we have yeah, just about 25% of the population vaccinated. Across the whole of the African continent, only around 10% of people have even had one dose of vaccine. Um, and so really that's where, where the, the problem lies in terms of the opportunity for this, uh, for the virus to spread and mutate and, and for this variant to take hold at, at pace potentially, um, if we do not do something about the inequity of, of vaccine access. But is there not an argument to say that if if Boris Johnson, who I'm no great fan of, but I have to say there have been parts of this, uh, including 
sort of holding firm and not locking down when it comes to uh, 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 recent pressure to do so, I thought was the right decision and credit where it's due. But isn't there an argument to say that had he made vaccine access more available to other countries, that there would have been an accusation to say, well, look, why are you worrying about those places? Why aren't you concentrating on making sure that the UK's vaccine programme is up and running, that the UK is looking after its own citizens, especially when you look at the political climate at the moment, when you look at Brexit, when you look at people perhaps wanting politicians to focus on problems here at home more than abroad, he would be between a rock and a hard place, surely. Uh, yeah, I think that's a very fair representation of the political pressure on, on, on Boris Johnson. Um, but you have to realise in this context, looking after number one alone does not ultimately keep you safe. Because what we will see if, you know, as you say, we don't know for definite yet, but if this new variant plays out in the way that some fear it might, um, it will come back. And um, if it is uh, evading the effects of the vaccines, that effort of scaling up vaccine at an incredible pace will be uh, being not for nothing, but will be completely undone and will be resetting the clock where we're trying to fight a pandemic where we don't have the most effective tools uh, that we could what have. What was the prevent. 20 million that we gave away? Not enough. We gave well, 20 million I, AstraZeneca vaccines to various places uh, in developing countries. Yeah, I mean, the, the simple answer to that is that what the government has done in terms of its of global vaccine access problem has been completely insufficient to solve the problem. So first of all, uh, we've um, we've hoarded doses and we've we've wasted doses. We allowed them to expire rather than giving them to other countries. Hundreds of thousands of doses of vaccine that we could have given to other countries and could have saved lives, which didn't. Uh, we also know that we've only actually donated about 11% of the vaccines that we've promised we would donate so we're yeah, still it's part of we, we we plan on giving 100 million <clears throat> by the end of 2022 we've given um about uh, 10 million already and another 10 million um will be uh, coming uh, i think has gone now as well um and that that is basically taking the total to 30.6 million surplus doses of astrazeneca which have been given to developing countries. So in total, we're going to be giving 100 million vaccines away. And I mean, that's great. I mean, the sooner the better on those uh, doses, because as we see, the longer people are left unvaccinated, the more dangerous it is, and the more people that die. But even once we give all of those doses away, the problem will still remain that we will have a huge lack of supply to treat people in every other part of the world. And that comes back to the, what I was talking about earlier. Big pharmaceutical companies are making an extraordinary amount of money from sales of these vaccines. Pfizer and Moderna alone are making $1,000 a second on sales of their vaccines. Uh, Pfizer alone is going to make over $100 billion this year and next in sales of its coronavirus products. And so those companies have got a real vested interest in maintaining tight control over those vaccines and preventing multiple other manufacturers from producing them. Now, if we allowed that to happen, we know that there are labs and manufacturers around the world sitting idle who could scale up and be producing hundreds of millions of more doses for global vaccine supply, but that hasn't happened. And one of the reasons it hasn't happened is because the UK and Boris Johnson are one of the very few countries that are blocking agreement for to facilitate exactly that outcome at the World Trade Organization. All right. And so we've warned from the start, if they don't change their uh, position on that, these variants are going to occur and it's going to lead to deaths in the developing world. And quite frankly, very sadly, it looks like they're going to cause deaths here in the UK as well. All right, Dermot McDonald, thank you. Uh, Dermot